evening, everyone. It's uh, great to see you all out. Um, I want to thank God for the music tonight. It was actually a blessing. A little bit better than last evening. Not that last evening was bad, but the band was stuck in traffic. Thank God for these antennas. It's, it's an important important component. Uh, Jesus would be proud. Um, not a huge fan of the, the pulpit, but this is a significant one. You can connect carabiners and do some climbing if you'd like. Uh, hey, it is great to see you all out. Uh, my name is, is Matthew. I hail from a town called Santa Elena, California, where we represent hip hop and believe that country music is clearly of the devil. Um, amen. Uh, we preach that and proclaim it. No more antennas. Just lost my signal. Um, but yes, I have been serving as the uh, uh, lead pastor, or directional leader, whatever you want to call it. Really, I'm a teaching pastor. I'm not much of a senior pastor. I leave that up to Jesus to do. Um, Jesus is the good shepherd, and um, and so I do see him as our senior pastor, which would make me, I guess, the junior pastor. And I'm happy uh, with that title. Um, actually, not a huge fan of titles altogether. Uh, I'm married to one woman, her name's Susan, and I love her very much. Um, she's younger than I am, by about four and a half years. Uh, she is the mother of our solitary offspring. Um, uh, our child's name is Julia, and she's 18 months on Tuesday. I love her very much. I uh, saw a video of Julia today on PATH, on the PATH app, um, which I represent. I've taken all, all the apps off my phone because I've found inappropriate images on most of them, and so I can't handle that stuff, and so I deleted it. Um, I have ADD. Um, uh, I love Jesus very much. Um, and then slowly, but, but surely, or soon and very soon, we will get into the Word of God, but I'm just trying to introduce myself to you a little bit. Not that I'm important at all. Um, I want you to hear this, though, and, and do believe and, and hear when I say uh, that Jesus Christ is the single most important thing that's ever happened to this planet. Um, he is the single greatest thing that has ever happened in my life. Uh, if you want to ask what the purpose is of this gathering, from my humble opinion, and I think um, your, your leader here, your youth uh, director here in this conference would agree, that the risen Christ is why we are here gathered over this Easter weekend. And by God's grace, the risen Christ is going to meet us here and speak to you. Um, I, I'm really humbled by it because I know that in me, um, I have no ability uh, to convert you, to convict you, to lead you to Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And so that's the humbling reality of preaching. That all said, God has chosen this mechanism of preaching the gospel. He's chosen it since day one. And so it is a huge honor to stand here in the lineage. And I'm not uh, just giving lip service to this. I've done a lot of thinking of why preaching. I mean, why did he raise up men and women to proclaim his goodness and his grace? Um, and for some reason, he's chosen broken men and women uh, to proclaim his goodness. If I was God, I would never do that. Um, but he has done it. But that all said, I'm a screwed up sinner in need of grace. And, uh, and here to represent Jesus. Uh, so that all said, I pray that he will speak to you tonight. If you were here last night, all 20 of you, um, a.k.a. the remnant, um, <laughs> I thank God for you. Uh, if you weren't here last night, you were clearly disobeying God's will for your life. So I um, just want to give you an opportunity to repent. Um, amen. Amen and amen. Uh, last night, what I did was, is I shared out of, out of the book of John several passages where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. So let me just try to catch you a little bit up to speed. I'm going to share with you the closing verses that I shared last night, 
And then we're going to dive into a passage of scripture in John 3. It's one you're very familiar with. You've probably heard it a million times over, but maybe God has a word for you tonight. I've been wrestling. Moy told me tonight, she said, hey, I'm going to need to know your topics for the coming days. I'll be frank with you. I don't know. Uh, I really don't. And I'm super sorry about that. But I've been preaching for a long time and showing up at places where I give a whole litany of texts, you know, a month in advance and tell you, this is where this is where we're going. And then I show up at the gathering and feel compelled to go somewhere else. Uh, so this is where I prayed up and since that God is leading us to tonight, I pray that it'll be beneficial. But I do need you to hear this. The, the death that Jesus paid on the cross is outstanding. Uh, so the death, so on this Good Friday that we are sitting here today, uh, this is Good Friday. On this particular evening, some 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died. Before sunset, he had died. So he was crucified. So this is a historical reality. Just as any historical figure is real, Jesus Christ is real. It just so happens that for Jesus, uh, there's more song, song about him, more art depicted about him, uh, more books written about this one guy who lived at 33 years. So to put it into context, I'm 38. Jesus was 33 when he died. And this world has never been, been the same because of one man. And what this one man taught is something that no one else taught. He taught that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And furthermore, he didn't just teach. As a matter of fact, I would go so far as to tell you that I don't believe that Jesus really focused a whole lot on his death. As good as his death is, because he paid the penalty for sin, as good as that is and as outstanding as it is, I would submit, I don't have this factual, but I'm starting to believe that Jesus focused more on his spirit than he did on his death. He prophesied about his death, but I would say to you that, that he was more concerned with and focused on his spirit. Why? Because he knew that you and I are going to do greater things than you've seen him do. He said, he's like, look, y'all are going to do even greater. The things you've seen me do, you're going to do even greater. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because Jesus himself, the same dude that walked the face of the planet, is going to die, but then he's going to rise again. And when he rises again, as he prophesied, he said, I'm going to send you the helper, or some translations call it the comforter. And I asked last night, or maybe this morning, who in here doesn't need, a help, need help? Like, who in here uh, right now, that if God was really your advocate and the greatest lover of your soul, who in this place would deny his help? And what Jesus taught when he was on this planet is, is he said, look, I'm going to send you the helper. In contrast, what do churches do? And I'm not here to bash churches, and Lord forgive me, uh, it does get warm under the, the, the tanning light, um, uh, and I need all the help I can get. My brother said that uh, I might be shining a reflection up on the, the roof. If I do, forgive me. I can't help it. Um, but maybe it's just the presence of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it's just all over me. Um, you guys, here's the deal. I believe, and there's a lot of deals, So, uh, and my last name's Gamble, so I, I deal it out. Um, but here is the deal. I believe that Jesus Christ is alive and well. I believe that the church is a great place. But I believe that God will mean nothing to you, or you won't know the power and magnitude of God unless you experience the abiding presence of Jesus in your life. And what that means is that Jesus lived the faithful years, died, rose again, and he sends the helper to come into you. Not to be an external God, but to actually come into you. So that said, before I pray, uh, if you have your Bibles tonight, you probably can't see them. Uh, but this passage will be up on the screen. This is in John chapter 20, and this is where we left off last night. The Bible says this. This is after Jesus died. This is actually Sunday, e uh, uh, sorry, yep, Sunday evening. The Bible says this. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, What church? 
peace be with you. And before we go running past that, I just need you to hear today and allow God to speak to you tonight. Because some of you have had a long week, or some of you have had a long month, or some of you have had a rough year. And, and maybe tonight your word that God would want to say to you and speak into your life is peace to you. Maybe some of you walk around and instead of singing soon and very soon and you're longing for the second coming of Jesus and desiring that day, maybe some of you are walking around with trepidation and fear that Jesus is going to come back and blow you up because you're screwed up in sin or because you've got issues going on and God will never love you. I'm here to set the record straight. Let me rephrase that. Jesus came to set the record straight. Jesus said in John 14, 9, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And if your picture of God, Victoria Conference, is that God is a vindictive God, a, a judgmental God that's here to blow you up and screw with you and make, make life hell for you, I would just challenge you to go and look at the life and teachings of Jesus. I would invite you to just study uh, through the four Gospels, pick up a book by one of my favorite authors, Ellen G. to the Whistle, uh, Desire of Ages. Uh, check it out, read Steps to Christ, and get into this, and you will see that Jesus is your greatest advocate. And so he comes to you tonight and just simply says to you, peace. Peace be to you. I've risen. You don't need to be afraid. Peace to you. He continues on. Uh, or it continues on. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And, the Jesus, and then Jesus said to them, again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. So that's the Great Commission. I'm sending you out. And then verse 22, and I just want you to hear this tonight. And so I just pray that this would speak to you. I pray that if you would glean anything from this weekend, that God would breathe into you his spirit. I can't do that. Moy can't do that. No pastor can do that. That the living God would show up and breathe into your life the Holy Spirit. So what does it say here? Uh, John 20, uh, verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. That is what the focus is this weekend, is the abiding presence of Christ in your life. Colossians 1.27 says this, this, that the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How does that happen? It is a miracle of God. What is it? It is a gift from God. He actually gives you and offers the gift. As I quoted last night, Jesus taught this. He said, look, what father on this planet? I have an 18-month at home. home. I said that already. If that chick comes up to me, she doesn't say bread, she says toast. Toast. So she comes up and says, Daddy? I say, yeah, baby. Toast. And then she does this thing, because in sign language, I think this is please. Does anybody know sign language? Is this please? No? Am I? Let's go with it. Australia, Australian sign language is different than the United States. Uh, this is how we say please in sign language in the U.S. Uh, with our American accent. Uh, but she says, Daddy, toast, please. Now, Jesus taught, what father, I mean, if I were to say to her, here, babe, suck on this rock. Like, just lick, lick on the rock. And Jesus says, what father on this planet, if their son comes up, their daughter comes up and says, Daddy, please hook me up with some bread, hands their offspring a rock. How much more is your father in heaven willing to give the, anybody? Spirit to those who ask of it. And I believe tonight that what Jesus desires in this place is to set us free in his spirit to fill us with more of him. And what happens when Jesus comes in is he pushes sin out. That's the natural occurrence. And so I just desire in my life, I pray that you do as well, I desire more of Jesus, less of sin. I've tried sin. I, I, I love sin, let's be honest. Um, I'm tired of it, though. I want it out of my life, and I want more of Jesus. So that all said, I'm going to pray. And then uh, we'll dive into Scripture in John chapter 3. And 
May God be praised. So let us pray together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be gathered in this place. Thank you for the opportunity to be on this continent. Thank you for calling your children out here tonight. As people are worshiping all over this campground, we would pray that your Holy Spirit would descend in extra measure. This gathering is unlike anything that's happened before and won't be duplicated again. So Jesus, would you maximize it to further your kingdom's growth? Would you maximize it to just unveil yourself to us? That we would have an encounter with you. That we would know that you're real, that you're alive and well today, that you care about us. That you have a plan and purpose for every single person sitting here in this tent. That you're a good God, that you're a gracious God, that you are a righteous God, that you are an all-powerful God. So Jesus, we're begging you to show up, work miracles in this place, set the captives free. As we read scripture tonight, may you be glorified in and through it. May you be lifted up, that in so doing you draw all people unto yourself, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says this in John chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, do open or check them out on your phone. or I don't know. Can you read them? Can you see them? Did you bring them? I don't know. Uh, but if you have them, great. If not, you can follow on the screen. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version uh, of Scripture. So John chapter 3, verse 1. The Bible says this. And this, again, is, should be a familiar story to most of you. Uh, but by God's grace, maybe something will jump out to you tonight. I really don't know where to look because I can't really see anybody over there, although I know I feel you. I feel you. I just can't see you. Uh, and not anybody. I mean, it's just kind of hard to see. So I kind of see uh, some heads over there and uh, representing. Um, don't know why I just said that, but um, just kind of thinking out loud. Uh, but yeah, I just pray that this would speak to you and be meaningful for our time here tonight. Uh, I do trip out with technology just a little bit because I do prefer to see people. It makes the whole experience way more enjoyable for me. But maybe I'm being selfish. Jesus sees you, and that's the most important thing. Amen. All right. Uh, John chapter 3, the Bible says this. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the what? Jews. Jews. You guys know this dude, Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. Okay. On the next slide, real quick, if you can, Kopam, Shaboom, Pharisee, okay? So just follow this definition real quick. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Uh, what is a Pharisee? I'm not trying to be crass with this definition. I actually got it from somewhere else, so I didn't just conjure this stuff up. I'm not trying to be jerk. I'm not trying to be, be demeaning. But a Pharisee is a legalist who interprets the law to every minute detail and they relied heavily on outward action and tradition. Oh, that is sweet baby Jesus. <laughs> Once you're in darkness, now you have come to the light. I mean, that is seriously, that just made my whole evening. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for revealing your good and perfect will to that person who turned on the light. Um, amen. All right. But I need you to follow this real quick, so we're all, this is so much more helpful. It's welcome, welcome, it's, it's welcome. I'm sorry about the pillars of, of speakers, but welcome to you and, and to you. It's good to see y'all. Um, we have multiplied since last night. It is a good thing. Uh, but hear this now. Here's the definition. A Pharisee, if a Pharisee heard this, like a real-life Pharisee, if they heard this, they'd be like, yeah, that's spot on. This explains who I am. I'm a legalist. I, I'm into the law. I interpret the law. I study the law. I meditate on the law. And they did study it to every minute detail. They rely heavily on outward action and tradition. And I would just simply ask you, does this remind you of anybody? Like, do you know any people that are this way? Or maybe you yourself, you're just like, man, that, I'm totally into that. Like, I, that is me. Well, that, you would be a Pharisee, okay? Churches today are slap-filled, and I'm not trying to be judgmental here. Like, I'm not trying to put down churches. I have an issue, and I'll confess an issue to you. Because now I'm at a church where I'm preaching every and teaching every single week, and somebody pulled me aside and reprimanded me and said, Matthew, you are angry. 
And I'm like, you're absolutely right, I'm angry. I'm livid. Why? What's the anger? What's coming, going on? Well, I am in a church, and some of you were at Avondale. A couple of you I've seen here. You guys were at Avondale a couple months ago, which was my hinge trip. What do I mean by a hinge? It was, I flew from Florida, went to Avondale and did a week of prayer, and then flew to California. That was my hinge of moving from Florida to California, and I was angry. Why? Because the church that I saw when I went out there to interview at this place, it's a 600 seat, it's a good sized church with about 80 people to 90 people, and that was the average age. And, and these people are there and they're, they're worshiping God. I'm not here to be crass or a jerk or disrespectful, but the music came on and instead of having something, y'all need to repent that you're not singing and dancing in this place and getting excited. Allow yourself, when we sing in this place, when we come around tomorrow morning and we're singing, you sing to the glory of God. Amen. Do not sing to, to your, your neighbor or don't worry about anybody else. You sing and move to the glory of God. Now, if God just leads you and you're just stiff and just, you know, dead and trespasses and sins, then just repent and allow him to free you to be expressive in your worship. What I experienced that first day at this church was sleigh bells, y'all. And I've never seen it before, so I'm going to describe it. And I'm sorry this is being videotaped because the dear lady that played the sleigh bells is a dear sister in Christ. And she bought these sleigh bells from Canada. And th this is a very true story. This was dead summer in the United States. You don't play summer and sleigh bells don't go hand in hand. Like Chris, if it was Christmas, this would have been perfect, but we were at the very furthest spot in the calendar away from Christmas, and sleigh bells had no part in what was happening. Furthermore, there was no one singing, so it was a rack, a bar with a rack and leather straps and bells affixed to the leather straps. No one was, she was just in it. I mean, it just straight deadpan. Shaking the leather straps, playing the bells. No one was singing along because no one knew how to sing along. And then it was accompanied by a piano. It was bad. Did I share this last night? It was bad. And then when I'm looking around the room and I'm asking myself, where is everybody at? I, my answer is, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't want to be sitting here. Now, some of you, you go to churches because you feel compelled or you feel obligated to go to church as though God is somehow pleased that you go to church. God's not, in my humble opinion, and I could be dead wrong, and I might need to repent. Y'all can come and convert me and speak to me, and I welcome any discussion. But I do not believe that Jesus Christ died so that you can go to church on a weekly basis and be bored out of your mind and receive no power, no spirit, no comfort, no guidance, no encouragement, uh, no true authentic community. But you just show up, put your best on, represent, put on your plastic stupid smile, and sing some songs, drop some coin in the bucket, and go. And then you go back, and what do you go back to? You go back to sin. And your life is no better off for going to church, aside from for that hour, hour and a half, one day a week, at that one point in time, you were spiritual. You were holy. Like you were without sin for that moment. But the power is missing. And something is fundamentally wrong. Uh, does that make any... I don't know what happened just then. Sorry. Um, but, but hear this now, you guys. Listen, please. You... You are not to be coming into this place, and our church ought to not be a place Jesus doesn't stand for and, and lead you to dissect the law to the minute detail. What Jesus does is, is he comes into your life and sets you free. He sets the captives free. What did sinners do when they were around Jesus? I would submit to you that if you look at the four Gospels, sinful people flock to Jesus. What do sinners do to our church? We repel them. And so they just run away. 
and they don't want anything to do with us. And I would simply submit to you that something is fundamentally wrong with that picture. I don't care how good your theology is. I don't care how good of a remnant person you are. Something is fundamentally wrong. And I don't know if any of this is making any bit of sense to y'all because y'all don't respond at all. Oh, just got a little bit of soul in this place. And you startled me and scared me. Um, but y'all, please, please, let me, let me set the record straight here. I don't care if you feel me tonight. I really don't. I used to say that. Are you feeling me? And then God convicted me. Stop saying, are you feeling me? Because it's not about you feeling me. But what you do need to feel is, is the living Christ. And what is good and what is perfect and what is of his, his character tonight, you need to grab hold of. I need to grab hold of because God is on the move. And soon and very soon, homie's going to come back. And here's the good news. Here's the good news. Jesus taught the same. And remember when Jesus ascended and the disciples were hanging out and then the two angels showed up. I think there were two. And they were like, what are you looking at? And they were like, well, Jesus is coming away. You know, please, please, uh, you know, dude, where are you going? You know, don't leave, it, don't leave us hanging, you know, whatever. And the angels, what did they say to them? They said, listen, the same Jesus you see going is what? The same Jesus that's coming back. Amen. Now, what did those disciples just do? They had just betrayed Jesus. Do you feel this? You don't, but just follow it. Uh, they had just betrayed Jesus. They are standing there with Jesus, and homie starts like, peace out, yo, you know, I'm out. And homie starts flying up. Were they afraid of him? Were they cowering and like defiling their loincloth by him? Were they, were they in fear and trepidation? I'm being serious now. Were they in fear and trepidation of the guy? Or did they want him to stay? They wanted him to stay. The same Jesus you see going is the same one that's coming back. And so you folks that will write me emails after our gathering, Matthew, I am, I am afraid that I have committed the unpardonable sin and that Jesus is going to come back and blow me up. And you laugh, but I'm dead serious. My wife, my own wife, when we left Seattle, where we had church planted and moved in 2008 to go to uh, another state, we go to church. She left crying that day. Crying. And I was like, what's going on, babe? Did somebody touch you inappropriate? You know, I was like, what is happening? And she said to me, Matthew, did you hear that message? And I was like, well, yes. I wasn't super motivated by it, but what she heard, notice what she heard is, is Susan, you're going to hell in a handbasket. And you're in luck because our Sabbath school all this morning brought straw together and they whittled handbaskets. And then on the way out, you got to pick one up that said your name on it to hell. And so now you get to go to hell in this handbasket. Have a good day. Like, thank you for coming to our church. She was devastated that day. And how many people come into our churches and hear that type of message? They hear this message of the investigative judgment. I don't know if you're feeling me or not. This is an Adventist camp meeting. Uh, but they hear this message of the investigative judgment, and they're like, no, you know, I don't know the day that my, my name is going to come across his book. And guess where your focus is? Your focus is all up on yourself. And that's what religion will do to you, is get you focused all up on yourself. So that segue led us now to back to this. Uh, well, look, what do the Pharisees do? They relied heavily on outward action and tradition. And that's what religion will do to you, is your focus will be on self and not on Jesus. And you wonder why we're powerless or why we're miserable in our lives. I would simply, again, submit to you that it's because we're inward focused. I mean, you come in here, Brother Nathan speak, and what I love about what God's laid on his heart 
is that it's all about social justice. And you look at the life of Jesus and what he taught is that he's going to set captives free. And that this church is going to be a church that attends to the poor. That his body is there to come and literally set people free and to deliver them. You look at the early church in the book of Acts. What did the people do? They got together, broke bread together. I don't know what that looked like. Just, I mean, we have these loaves because there's a deli down the street that donates us bread every week. And we just long, I'll see young little girls, like eight-year-old girl, just walking around with a long, huge, just stick of bread. Stick of bread at church. Big smile. And then she'll just bite into the end of that thing. Cacao. Just heh, break me off a little something, something. Um, but the early church would get together and break bread together, and then guess what they would do? If you were in need, they would sell stuff to give to others that were in need. Like, they were a body. They were a community. Uh, Jesus didn't d die for you. Jesus didn't come to this planet to live here uh, so that he could just be a role model for you and show you this is how you got to live if you want to get to heaven. No, Jesus came and died for you. So that you can have life and life more abundant. Anyway, Nicodemus, Pharisee, legalist, into the law, into outward appearance. Some churches I'm not able to go to and speak unless I dress a certain way. I'm not able to speak there and unless you got the tie on. Pagan phallic symbol. Um, <laughs> Nicodemus, Nicodemus was one of the members of the Sanhedrin where religious leaders studied and debated the law. They were into this thing, and the big focus for them and their ministry was studying and debating the law and dissecting this thing. Let's pick it back up. Jesus, verse 2. We are doing so well tonight. This is the abbreviated version. It's 8.45. They told me to land the plane at 11.30. We'll go to the cafe. That joke never gets old. Thank you, Gibbo. All right, verse 2, here you go. The man came to Jesus by night, so Nicodemus comes up to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for what? No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. I want you to hear something real quick on that text. I didn't see this before, but here's the deal. I believe that if Jesus Christ is alive and well today, which I do believe, and if Jesus Christ is living in you, guess what people are going to say to you? They will say things like, no one can do this. There's no way you did that unless God is with you. So the same thing that Nicodemus is observing about Jesus is the same thing that, that people are going to observe about you and this church. There's no way that you can do this stuff unless God is with you. But I want you to paint this picture. So we're digressing now. Jesus, Jesus is chilling and it's late night. And homie is looking at, he's like at, up at a park. Y'all have park, you have a park. And Jesus is just chilling all alone, him and the father. And he's like, Father, you are so good. Hallelujah is right. And he's like, this is awesome. I'm at the park. Jerusalem is down below. It is late night. We are all alone. Crowds have been coming. I've just turned water to wine. I'm, you know, doing my thing. We're having a good time. I'm here on this planet. What's up? Hanging out all alone. In comes walking Nicodemus, and Nicodemus come up and pump, pump, and tap, tap on Jesus' shoulder. And Jesus just chilling. Nicodemus tap on Jesus' shoulder and say to him, Yo, man, what's up? <laughs> Yo, um, no one can do the stuff that you do unless God is with you. And Jesus is like, huh, just chilling. So let's look at what happens in the very next verse. But you need to hear that now. So what happened? He walks up, pow, pow, pow. Yo, man, yo, man, no one can do the things that you do unless God is with you. Well, how does Jesus respond? Very next verse. Verse 3, Jesus answered him, truly, truly. I love that phrase, truly, truly. I want to name a song named truly, truly. <laughs> Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you that unless one is born again, he cannot, what, church? See the kingdom of God. Thank you. 
He cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, walk up. I'm going to kill myself over these microphones. <laughs> Nicodemus, walk up. Pound, pound, pound. Yo, man. No one can do the stuff that you do unless God is with you. Jesus. Truly, truly. <laughs> I tell you the truth, man. Uh, no one can uh, see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, do you understand that this is not a, a normal flow of a, of a progressing conversation? Yo, man, nice shirt. Truly, truly, I say to you, um, unless you are born again, you will not see the... Yo, dude, no. You don't. No, you just misunderstood. I'm just trying to tell you you are the man. That's all I'm trying to say is, you're the man. And you're talking about truly, truly. Uh, so Jesus says, now hear this now too. So number one, this is abnormal. Okay, so conversations don't roll this way. Number two, what you will note is what Jesus does is, is he doesn't screw with people. He doesn't play around with people. He doesn't beat around the bush. And furthermore, this is a divine appointment. As I said a moment ago, I take preaching very seriously because this is the lineage, this heritage of preaching and proclaiming the gospel has been around for 6,000 years. It is one mechanism. The Bible is another mechanism that God chooses to reveal his good and perfect will to people. But this is a divine appointment. And what was going down at that moment was a divine appointment between Nicodemus and Jesus. Nicodemus came up trying to talk some business. Jesus wasn't hearing it. And Jesus wasn't worried by, about it, nor was he deterred by it or, or bent out of shape. He didn't focus on it. What he focused on was the priority. What is the priority to Jesus? You need to hear this right now. The priority to Jesus is, is that you see the kingdom of God. Because all you see on this planet is the kingdom of Satan. If you don't believe me, just run a check on yourself. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. <laughs> but I'm dead serious. I don't know where the ghetto talk is coming from tonight. Uh, but I'm dead serious. Check yourself. Look around your life. What do you see unfolding before you? Is it goodness? Is it wholesome? Is it pure? Is it filled with joy and peace and long-suffering? Are you walking in the goodness of life? Are you tasting the freedom of Christ? Or are you experiencing the bondage of Satan? Now, I don't care how religious you are. I don't care. This is why I told my church several times, I've been reprimanded for this statement, so I'm trying to slow it down. I don't mean to say it. I don't plan stuff and it just comes out of my mouth. But I've told my church several times, if I have a prophetic bone in my body, I venture to guess either I'm going to be fired in a year's time or we're going to be thriving. And I would prefer the latter. Trust me. Trust me. But I potentially will be fired. Why? Because I don't care. I don't need no job. I'm not in, you know, I'm not in ministry for a job. I'm in ministry for Jesus, and I love Jesus. Now, that all said, I love this church, but what I hate about this church is religion. And what I hate is, is what religion does to people, where it leads them to focus on their external behavior and not focus on the living presence of Jesus Christ in our life, where we lead people and teach people over and over again. You have to spend. We prescribe things to people. Come to church. What are you going to learn? Well, if you spend an hour in your Bible, let me, let me give you a prescription. One hour in your Bible plus 30 minutes of prayer plus 10% tithe plus stop all your sinning, and you're going to go to heaven. Shrimp, rip, here. Just take it and do these things. And so what do we lead people to do? We're, we're focused on these behaviors. Well, if I just do these things, if I just learn how to juggle and prove to God that I'm worthy to go to heaven, then maybe he'll accept me. That's not how the kingdom of God works. And so what Jesus can do that religion can't do and never will do is set you free and start giving you 
a new vision. Amen. What does he do to blind people? He doesn't remove their eyes. He heals their eyes from the inside out. What does Jesus tell the church in Laodicea? Buy from me eye salve so that you can see. Laodicea was a town that was known for their eye center where people would come to get healing in their eyes. And Jesus says to them, look, you might have physical sight and you sitting here right now and like the brother's going to sing tonight, you might have physical sight. But Jesus wants to give you spiritual sight so that you have spiritual discernment. So that you start seeing this world a little differently and you start seeing your life a little bit differently and your values start to change. And what you start seeing is, is the kingdom of God. And what Jesus ushered in is the kingdom of God. What Jesus wants you to have is an identity where you are an heir of the Son of God. You are an heir of the Son of God. You are an adopted Son of God. And your citizenship, while you are a citizen of Australia, your citizenship is not just that. Your identity is not that. Your identity is, is you are a citizen of the kingdom of God. Amen. And what Jesus is doing is, is raising up that kingdom here and now. And what that looks like when his spirit pours out onto a group of people is otherworldly. Why? Because his kingdom is not of this world. All you've experienced in your life is sin and suffering, pain. Do you have some good times? Absolutely. Uh, but what Jesus is trying to do is set us free to lead us into his kingdom. He values that you see the kingdom of God truly, truly, unless you're born again. So how does it happen? You're born again. He's going to unpack this. Verse 4, uh, continuing on. We're just going to verse 36 tonight. It's a bad joke. Um, but I repent, and, and y'all will forgive. Uh, verse 4, but where, seriously, we established this last night, where do you have to go? I mean, where are you going to go, man? I'm serious. When that dude was driving me, picked me up from the airport, and that team of human beings in that, in that van, I had never met these humans in my life, and about two hours into the journey up here, where I had not seen a traffic light in about two hours, I had not seen a restaurant, no Starbucks, no nothing. I was like, Lord, where is this man taking me? <laughs> um, this is clearly not of you. Where are we going? <laughs> Welcome to Melbourne. <laughs> and how we all pronounce Melbourne, Melbourne, is totally beside me, man. M-E-L-B-O-U-R-N-E, Melbourne. <laughs> you don't need to repent. It's just not even right. It's not even, not even proper English. E. E. All right, verse 4. Verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, so he just said, you've got to be born again. Nicodemus said to him appropriately, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Which, you guys just read that, and you're like, yeah, that's normal. It is normal. If you were rocking up to Jesus that night and said, yo, dude, I mean, you're only three chapters deep into Jesus' life, and you're walking up to him, yo, bro, what's going on? What's good? Man, no one can do the things that you do unless God is with you. Truly, truly, I tell you, you, you got to be born again. And, and then G Nicodemus hears this born again. Yo, what you, you want me to, you know, climb up into my mother's room? <laughs> Like, and I'm glad you're laughing because that would be a laughable moment. Uh, but Nicodemus, I mean, would you not say the same thing if some dude walks up to you and says, have you been born again? Do you understand how foreign that question would be? What do you mean born again? Do you know that Jesus is the one that introduced that statement? Uh, and he introduces it to Nicodemus on that particular night. So Nicodemus, having not heard that, is like, yo, what, what you talking about, Willis? I don't know if that's a... Uh, Y'all know that reference? Oh, mercy. Um, you know, what you talking about? Where are you going with this born again stuff? I'm not following this. Jesus, yet again. I venture to guess in my mind's eye that Jesus still has not even turned to look at Nicodemus. And so we get to verse, uh, verse 5. We're moving right along. Rapid fire, verse 5, Jesus answered. What's he say, church? Truly, truly. Just how Jesus rolls. Next time you're in line to order some food, just 
truly, truly. I want that strawberry shake. Amen. All right, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is what, church? Born of what? Water and the Spirit. Uh, he cannot what? Enter the kingdom of God. So notice what again, what again, what's the repeated phrase? Kingdom of God. What did he say in verse 3? I want you to see the kingdom of God. What does he say in verse 5? I want you to enter the kingdom of God. Some of you have seen the kingdom of God. You've gone somewhere. You've been around camp meeting. You've come to this place and you've, you've seen the kingdom of God. You've tasted it. And now what Jesus is saying is, is I don't want you to just see it. I want you to enter it. How do you enter it? You are born of two things. And unfortunately, and I'll just say this till the cows come home. I don't know what that phrase means, because if I own cows, I wouldn't want them in my house. But I will say this. I will tell you this. Some of you, please feel me on this. Some of you, you've been born of the water. So you were like, you know, I, I mean, you, my wife was eight when she got baptized. You're born of the water. You've heard the word of God preached. You were convicted of sin in your life, and you got baptized. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. But, and this is a big but, and I like big butts, and I cannot lie. Okay, okay now listen. Listen. Please feel me on this. That is a bad reference. Uh, that is bad. And I can't believe I was reprimanded once before. Very hard. Very hard reprimand. But I'm saying a B-U-T is, is a significant but in the, in the flow of the conversation we're having right now. It is significant. Um, hear this now. Some of you, you have been born of the water, but you haven't been born of the Spirit. Let me repeat that again. You got born because of the forgiveness of sin. You got baptized because of the forgiveness of sins. And that's a good thing. But guess what? That's what John, ba John the Baptist did. He came to set the, the, the way of the Lord and part the way, and he baptized people for repentance. What Jesus does is he comes, and he doesn't just baptize with water. He baptizes with the Spirit. And when you start experiencing the Spirit, that's when you truly live. Is the water good? Absolutely. Is it necessary? 100%. But is it a complete picture? Absolutely not. The only reason in the whole canon of Scripture why a person was rebaptized is because they hadn't heard about the Holy Spirit. And what Jesus teaches here in John chapter 3 is unfortunately not something that most of our, our churches do focus on, uh, proclaim, teach. When we baptize somebody at our church, the glory of God, I mean, I don't know, I'm not big into numbers, but we baptized two dudes so far uh, since I've been out there. Uh, one dude was a recovering drug addict that's been coming to our church, praise God, not an Adventist, but wanted to get baptized. We baptized the dude. Another guy was born and raised in the church. He was like the, the criminal of Angwin, Angwin, California. He was like the, the Angwin gangster. Uh, been to prison twice. Just got out of prison, started coming to our church, hasn't been to church in like 25 years. God got a hold of his life, uh, and he gets baptized. For both of those brothers, what do we do? We baptize them in water, and then we lay hands on the person biblically and pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon them in extra measure. Why? Because that's what God taught. Why? Because Jesus wants you to not just see the kingdom of God, he wants you to enter the kingdom of God so that when you're driving in Melbourne uh, or when you're driving in Podunk, wherever you live, wherever you roll, you re recognize Monday through Sunday, Sunday through Saturday, whatever you want to call it, 365, your identity is, is I'm a part of the kingdom of God. So when I'm driving down the road, I'm part, I'm, I, am a, I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. I am an heir of God. What is Jesus's is completely mine. I am eligible and can partake of anything that is Jesus's because I am an heir, an heir to the king, and he has adopted me. So he says to Nicodemus, uh, you got to be born of the water, born of the spirit in order to what? 
enter the kingdom of God. What I would simply submit to you tonight, church, is, is the kingdom of God is super important to Jesus. He really values the thing. And if he is abiding in you, speaking to you, guiding you, directing you, he will lead you to have huge value in the kingdom of God. And I confess this to you. It's only been in the last like year and a half that this theme, had, like the Lord has just been pounding this theme into my brain. The kingdom of God. And it's rocking my world. Amen. Amen. All right, let's continue on. Uh, verse, uh, verse, was that a saxophone? Truly, truly, I mean. <laughs> All right. Repent. These sinners. All right, verse 6. Verse 6. Watch it now, because this is super important. We're going to land the plane here in about an hour and a half. Verse 6. <laughs> the laugh. Did you notice how it just it went down a couple notches? Ha <laughs> 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 ha! That ain't funny, man. <laughs> I'm here to find that single Adventist man. <laughs> he messing me up, dude. Friday night. Get out the way. And move. What? Get out the whip, sir. All right, this is I don't, this is like ghetto night in here at Big Camp. I'm so sorry for that, for those of you who would be grossly offended. Just remember, country music's of the devil. Verse 6. <laughs> Verse 6, listen to this church please, that which is born of the what? Flesh, Flesh is what? Flesh. And that which is born of the? Spirit. Is what? Spirit. Spirit. Now watch this now please just real quick, I eat it like this is kind of a soapbox for me but I'll try to make this quick. Inside of you, if you tonight are atheist, agnostic or Adventist, it really doesn't matter. Would you not agree that inside of you is this pull? This like tug of war pull. One side is for the spirit, the other side is for the flesh. In your life, I would venture to guess if you were to take a pulse right now and just take time out and think about your day to day, I would submit to you that probably you have two different small voices, or in plural, if you are a scholar, a voice I. Um, you have two voices inside your noggin. One voice, like the cartoon when you were a little dude growing up watching the, it's cartoon time. I'm going to watch this thing. What would they pop up? Pom pom. It'd be an angel on one, a on one shoulder and a devil on the other. Ha ha, you know, whatever. Uh, but these two voices contradict one another. Are you following this? Amen. And what those voices are, represent, is the flesh of the spirit. And what Jesus simply teaches is, is that if you come into this world, and the reality is this, real quick. When you are born... You are born into the flesh. What Jesus says is, and that's why you've got to be born again, is because you've got to be born of the Spirit. And until you're born of the Spirit, all you're born is in is the flesh. Every human being faces it. It's a common reality for anybody. I don't care if you were born in the church or out of the church or believe or don't believe. We're all born into the flesh. And so we all sin. And what Jesus is saying is, is that which is born of the flesh is flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now what does this mean for you that were born and raised in the church, you got baptized, and you're still funky, and you still got issues? What I would say to you, well we all got issues, so let me not uh, pretend that we don't, but what I would say to you is this, is that some of you sitting in here today, you've been baptized, but you were just, you kept on in the flesh. Because you never heard about the Holy Spirit. You never understood that it's not about the cross. It's about Him resurrecting. And the cross is great, don't get me wrong. And what He did there is outstanding. But He doesn't leave you hanging at the cross. Amen. He rises again on the third day so that He can send you Himself to abide in you. That's why He taught, y'all. It's going to suck. I'm going to go away. I know there's going to be heartache, but it is fitting that I go, is what Jesus said. So that when I go, I can send you the helper who will come into you. What does Jesus teach? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah. How does that happen? How does he do that? He does it by abiding in you, by sending his spirit up inside of you. How does it happen? You've got to be born again. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel, verse 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. And so it is with how many? Everyone. Come on, church. How it, how, and so it is with everyone. everyone who is born of the spirit. So here's the deal, you guys. I'm not trying to be self-promoting here, but the reality in my life is, is that my life has been blown, man. I mean, I'm not here to, to boast about me. I'm here to boast about Jesus. And what Jesus will do in your life is he'll bend you in directions and send you to places you would have never dreamed, hoped, or imagined. Y'all, in 2011, again, not here to boast of my flesh, but in 2011, my wife finished residency. We moved down to Florida where... I got baptized in St. Augustine. I graduated high school down there. Susan and I had our first kiss on the beach there. Uh, we bought our house there in a gated community on a golf course with a pool in the back. I'm going to start getting real happy and sappy right now. Uh, but a pool in the ground. It was an in-ground pool uh, with a screen fence around it. It wasn't a huge house, but it was a beautiful home a mile from the beach. We gave birth to our, our first child there in St. Augustine. My parents lived right around the corner. We loved that place. We moved in there on September 9. Why? Somebody was talking about the sabbatical year today. We actually moved down there and said, we're going to take a sabbatical year. We both work, but we slowed down big time. So we just pulled it way back. Right and dirty. Just joking. Um, but uh, we just slowed way down. Then the phone rings when I'm leaving big camp last year, thinking, no lie, I was, th and we started talking about church planning with these four people right now. We were talking about church planning. I thought I was going to come here. I get on a plane and fly home. I get to LA. I get off the plane. The phone rings, conference president talking about Elm Saving. Y'all, Matthew Gamble and Elm Saving do not go hand in hand, man. It just does not mix or match at all. We just bought a house. Long story short, when Christ is in your life, he does stuff. He flips the script. He brings stuff into focus that you least imagine. I would have never imagined, why would we buy a house? But when the Holy Spirit comes up in your life, and y'all, so I'm going to end my story there. We did move. And we are seeing the goodness of God poured out. My wife doesn't see it as much as I do. Uh, but... but <laughs> But we are seeing the goodness of God pour out. Our, uh, not that it's about attendance, but our attendance has quadrupled in five months, man. Woo. And we're seeing people come back to Christ and in relationship. It's not about me, but it is absolutely outstanding to be a part of the goodness of God. And seeing His power magnified in people's lives. I love it, man, and I love that church. I love being a part of it, but it is crazy. And what happens is, is in every single believer, when you are born again, when you have the Holy Spirit living in your life, I promise you here, I promise you, not because it's me, but because of Him. Like the wind blows, you hear its sound, you don't know where it's coming from or where it goes, and so it is that every person that is born of the Spirit so if your life is sitting there stagnant, I'm not saying your life is going to be filled with fireworks. I'm not saying that. But if you're not experiencing the fruit of the Spirit in your life, something is fundamentally wrong. If you're not seeing the evidence of God and you're not bearing fruit, this is another thing I hate about church and hate about religion is we ordain elders and deacons and pastors even that have no fruit, that have no fruit. And I'm not saying it's about like sitting there and keeping score of what, what's being done, but it is, it is the evidence of Christ living in your life when you start experiencing the fruit of the Spirit in your life. Why? Because you can't conjure that stuff up. You can't make that happen. Only God can. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear it sound, but you do not where it comes from, uh, where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Verse 9, and then we're, gonna, we're, we're about to land the plane. Seriously, like ETA, come on in, come on in, come on in. <laughs> All right, verse 9. It's 9.15, they told me 11.30, but we're, we're landing the plane, promise you. All right, watch this now. Uh, Nicodemus said to him, no laugh, that time. Uh, Nicodemus said to him, watch this now, we are coming in, seriously, I'm probably like five minutes out. Uh, 
Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you not a teacher of Israel, yet you do not understand these things? And what's he say again? Verse 11. You can guess it. Yep, truly, truly, there it is. Just keeping true to form. Uh, truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Verse 13, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him might have eternal life. And I need you to hear this right now because this is Good Friday. Uh, Jesus predicted, as Moses lifted up the ser serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And what he's talking about here, I believe, actually has at least twofold meaning. One is, is that he's going to, or maybe threefold. One is, is that he's going to be lifted up on the cross for the sins of the world. So just as Moses uh, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The other way that Jesus was lifted up is, is when he defeated death and sin once and for all, and he ascended. The other way that Jesus is lifted up is 2,000 years later, you come here to Victoria Big Camp, gather in this tent, and Jesus is lifted up and proclaimed to you. Amen. And what happens is, is that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. So what Jesus really values is that you see and enter the kingdom of heaven. And in so doing, that you experience eternal life. And I actually believe, church, that eternal life begins today. Uh, for those of you who don't have Jesus, aren't walking with Jesus, haven't experienced Jesus, that eternal life begins today. Uh, continuing on here, uh, verse 16 and 17, and then I'm done. The Bible says this, you've heard this, so say this with me, church, let's just say this in unison. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, continue. For God did not send his Son into this world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. I need you to hear this again, and I'm going to invite my man... Uh, Neville Peter, Peters to come on up. Uh, he is here somewhere, I believe. Yes, he's coming on up. Um, as he's making his way on up, I want you to hear something right now. And here's another fundamental difference between religion and Jesus. Religion will condemn. It's what it does best. Pharisees, legalists, what they do best is condemn. Because their focus is on the law and performance. Jesus doesn't focus on those things. He actually comes to deliver you from those things. And what Jesus says to you tonight, and I need you to hear this, please, is that he is not here to condemn you. I need you to hear that over and over again, that if you have sin in your life, if you're walking around and you... You experience a cloud of guilt that Jesus is not here to condemn, but that he came to die, live a faithful life, to die and to rise again, and to now send you his Holy Spirit. So as Neville plays, I just pray that you would take this time to meditate on his word, meditate on the goodness of God, and then I'll come up and close with a word of prayer. Amen and amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me tonight, and we'll close with a word of prayer. Thank God for you, Neville, and for sharing that with us. Thank you. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I thank you for this opportunity once again to gather in your name. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would let it rain, that the Holy Spirit would pour out in this place, that you would pour out in our lives, that, Lord Jesus, we would have an encounter with you, that we would experience you, that our life would truly not be the same. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness, for your righteousness, for your long-suffering, for your endurance. Thank you, God, that you are the great initiator in our lives. May you, Lord Jesus, continue to reveal your good and perfect will in and through us. And we will be sure to give you all praise, honor, and glory. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.